system overflow room. What I'd like to ask you to do, if possible, is if you're here with a crowd of people and one person is talking, if some of those might be able to get to the overflow room so the speakers could be here, that would be a little more helpful. Everybody's still going to be here. They're going to get it live streamed. Uh, so I'm going to take a moment to turn it over to the hospital CEO, uh, Chris Dorman, to say a few words and welcome us here to TIFF Regional. Thank you, Senator, and uh, welcome everyone. I think this is a great turnout. Uh, you know, we were expecting 30, and there's probably 100, uh, which I think this is probably the largest crowd that uh, the committee has seen so far, which obviously screams the, the, the needs for change and reform for uh, all of us in South Georgia. So I'm really thankful that you all came out and uh, looking forward to seeing some really positive changes based on what we here in the committee meeting. So welcome everyone, thank you all. Again, there is an overflow room upstairs. Uh, if that one overflows, I'll find another place. Uh, there are restrooms just outside this door. There's two here and then there's two additional restrooms outside that door as well. And if you get lost, we'll be sure to get you back. So again, welcome and uh, thank you all for coming. Good morning, I'm Senator Sally Harrell. I am actually the author of Senate Resolution 770 that created this study committee. Um, let us take a moment to, to bow our heads um, and invite the spirit into our bodies in whatever form that might take and share a short reflection together. Holy Spirit, we know you by many names, but we are still part of one community. Open our hearts and minds so that we see love in the face of every person on this earth. Help us to form, form bonds of compassion, dignity, and respect. Guide us to fully grasp that differences within and among us never lessen the need for love, friendship, belonging, respect, and for the opportunity to work, contribute, and lead. Let prejudice, stigma, fear, and presumptions never interfere with our ceaseless efforts to assure that each and every person is able to feel the embrace of family and the loving support of community. Amen. Well, good morning again. It's an honor to be here. Uh, we are in the district of Senator Cardin Summers. Unfortunately, Senator Summers uh, has a family medical emergency that he is attending to this morning. But for those that live uh, here uh, in Tifton or the surrounding areas, Cardin does an amazing job serving you down uh, at the Georgia Capitol. Uh, and I know he wanted to be here today and says his wishes, and we are working with him, uh, both Chairwoman Harrow and myself, to make sure that all of the recommendations and future legislation or budget uh, is channeled appropriately so we can take care of each and every one of the communities that we serve. So uh, on behalf of Cardin, I just want to uh, take a moment to uh, brag on the great work he does and know that he's here for you. We've got a, uh, a pretty packed uh, agenda today with speakers, and when we get to that point, we're going to ask for your help just a little bit. Uh, with a lot of speakers, uh, if somebody decides they're going to take a lot of time, they will take away the opportunity for other people to speak. So we're going to keep the time limit right down, down to two minutes for everybody to speak. I know that's a short amount of time. Um, so we're giving you a little time to prep now, if you could, to consolidate. Otherwise, we won't give everybody the opportunity to talk. However, Right behind us, you can see this great picture of uh, Senator Harrell. That is the website, SenatorResolution770.com. That's put up there for many reasons. The first one is to tell you what's going on, where we have our meeting locations, uh, the dates and times, as well as there's recordings of, of past meetings and an opportunity for you to send us something online, which is a great way to communicate. Some folks don't like to testify. Uh, others might think of something after the meeting they forgot to tell us. Please know if you submit something there, we are reading those, we are looking through those, and we are using all the information we get in order to base our recommendations in our final meeting, which will be next month back at the state capitol. Uh, so please use that, and if anybody is listening online or is not even in the building today, that is another vehicle for which they can reach each one of us. Uh, so before I turn it back over to Senator Harrell, uh, I do want to say something that I say at every single meeting. 
I don't use the word disabilities because there are people in this room that have been given that label and they don't have them. We do. If the world would see life through somebody with a special need, it would be a much, much better place. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, let's have a wonderful meeting today. Thank you for coming. I'll turn it over to uh, Senator Harrell. And I'm going to have everyone at the table um, introduce themselves so you know who's up here. Um, but one th story that I like to tell when I have these meetings is that I've been working on this issue um, of access to services for a long time now because um, I served in the Georgia House of Representatives back in the late 90s and early 2000s. After that, I took about a 15-year break from politics and came back to the Senate um, in 2018. But when I came back in 2018 and found the waiting list um, still with thousands of people on it, I was heartbroken because I had worked on that issue way back in like 1999, 2000, when there was a huge campaign called Unlock the Waiting List shortly after the Olmstead court decision. And to think that that there was enough time between when I served in the House and the Senate for me to raise my own children. Um, while that waiting list was still there, it just devastated me. And so I literally made this my number one issue last session um, to work on getting more funding um, for now and comp waivers, which we did do. Um, we, we had a historic level of funding with funding um, 500, but we need to have a plan of how to get to the rest of the 7,000. So that's why I introduced the resolution to create this study committee. To me, it's just unacceptable that um, our government hasn't um, taken care of this issue in uh, literally decades. So I'm going to stay on it until, until we do. And uh, now to introduce the rest of the committee members. Uh, hello, I'm Brian Dowd. I'm the Deputy Executive Director over Policy Operations and Compliance at the Department of Community Health. We're the single state Medicaid agency for Georgia. Many of you guys may know me as the old waiver guy, which was my previous role. Um, so I'm very glad and thankful to be here today. It's always great to get your input. Good morning. My name is Ashley Caseman. I'm the Director of Waiver Services for the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, uh, DBHDD. We are the operating agency for the Now and Comp Waivers, and I am uh, responsible for policy uh, for on behalf of DBHDD. Great to be here today. Thank you. I am going to take a moment to introduce a couple of our committee members that could not be here today. The first is Senator Dean Burke, who uh, is down in Bainbridge, represents Southwest Georgia. Dr. Burke is, does a phenomenal job uh, helping out with all things uh, related to health and uh, rural Georgia. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he got called to a meeting uh, up in Atlanta today, but he does a great job, and he is actively engaged with the budgetary part of this process as well. Also, we have Senator Marty Harbin uh, up in the Peachtree City Fayetteville area uh, who is unable to attend, as well as Senator Donzella James from uh, Fulton County in the Atlanta area. Uh, they are, uh, though I believe, participating all on our live stream today and will be texting over uh, any questions uh, or input that they have to us during the meeting. Hey, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry, getting used to the microphone. Uh, my name is Darcy Robb. I am the Executive Director of the Georgia Council on Developmental Disabilities. We are governed as a DD Council by a Council of People with Developmental Disabilities, family members of people with developmental disabilities, and state agency representatives. So I want to be very clear about who we are uh, and who governs us. And our mission is to make the kinds of social and policy changes um, for people with developmental disabilities and their families that support them to live, learn, work, live, and play in their communities. So I am thrilled uh, with the work of this committee, and I am so excited to see so many folks come out today. Uh, really interested to see what y'all have to sh share with us. Nope. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. We have one speaker on the agenda as a speaker today, and then we'll move to public testimony. So our first speaker is 
Oh, okay. Before we do speakers, thank you. Before we do speakers, um, we will have some updates from our staff. Thank you, Senator Harrell. Um, again, my name is Ashley Caseman, um, and um, on behalf of DBHDD, I want to provide two updates today, um, and I will be as brief as possible in an effort to reserve as much time as possible for public testimony. Um, my first update is quick. Um, as part of uh, this committee, I have been providing ongoing updates uh, regarding waiver admissions. Uh, this is in response to the record 513 new waivers that were a part of the most recent state budget. In addition to the 31 waivers that were awarded in July of this year and the 52 waivers that were awarded in August of this year, I am pleased to announce that an additional 52 waivers were awarded in September of this year, totaling 135 waivers um, uh, since the beginning of the fiscal year, July of 2022. And my second update is a little bit more detailed, but I know it's on the forefront of all of, uh, of providers' minds, and so I want to take a minute to talk about the 5% um, for the uh, now in comp uh, providers. As many of you know, there is a 5% rate increase for all IDD services as part of the FY 2022 budget. Um, a positive update is that as of July 6, 2022, all claims providers are billing and receiving include the 5% rate increase. So July 22 and forward payments are being made with the 5% increase from the appropriations. Where the challenge is, is the retro effective payments. Um, and, and this is for the 5%, not for the entire um, payment from um, July 21 to July 22. And it's important to have some context. I'm gonna give some of that to you today. These rate increases would typically go into our base now and comp waivers. However, the comp had been wedged at the federal level for over 15 months, and the state could no longer wait for that waiver to come back down before we started acting. So we decided to make full use of a temporary public health emergency waiver called the Appendix K to get that appropriation faster and to allow it to go retro, which our base waivers do not guarantee. Truthfully, if we had used our base waivers, that 5% would likely still be pending federal approval, and there was no guarantee that it was going to go retro, right? So the Appendix K was and is still the fastest mechanism for the 5% rate increase. It was approved spring of 2022, March 9th of 2022, that is where our clock starts, right? Because remember, two-thirds of the payments are paid out by the federal government, and it has to be approved by CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, before we can do anything, regardless of the state appropriation, truthfully, if we want to claim the entire match, right? Um, it's also important to know that there has never been a scenario where every single service for every single payment for every single person receiving a NOWER comp waiver has had to go back an entire year for payments because we never had that option before the public health emergency, right? Um, this decision uh, to go retro, like I said, it is the first time we have ever done this because it's the first time we've ever been able to do this. And it has been hard on our systems, right? We're talking about 27,000 authorizations, 1.6 million lines of very specific code, um, which was a major shock to our billing systems, which, like I said, never had to support this type of action before because it wasn't allowable. So again, I'm talking about the retro payments. July 22 and forward are being paid. Um, as Brian mentioned last committee, the PAs have gone from DBHGD's billing system to DCH's system for the mass adjustment reprocess. Um, DCH's billing system vendor Gainwell Technology plans to begin reprocessing the now in comp retro claims in early December with the intention of being finished by the end of the calendar year, um, if not sooner. Reprocessing claims will be prioritized by oldest claim first based on the uh, original reprocessing date um, and future billing guidance will come out for providers on certain specialty claims. 
Uh, note for providers, there is no action needed at this time uh, for the 5%. So again, an unprecedented move by the department to go back for the first time to the very first day of the appropriation. Never done that before. Trust me, I went back. <laughs> A decade and looked at previous appropriations versus when they were approved and this is the first time we've done this right um, our billing systems are catching up and they're getting smarter for future rate increases um, and uh, and like I said July and moving forward those payments are being paid out and um, the retro payments will begin rolling out early December um, so I thought it was important, thank you uh, for letting me take the time today to do that, um, but I thought it was important for providers to have the most up-to-date information about that 5% because we know just how important that money is and how crucial it is to providers, which is why, again, we use the appendix case so we could go back to the first day of appropriation and make sure every single dollar that was appropriated got federal match and got sent out to, to the network. All right, so I could keep going, but I want to reserve time for public testimony. I am available for questions. Or, Brian, feel free if you have anything you want to add. Um, thank you, Senator Harrell and Senator Albers, for the ability to give these updates today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley. I know we've gotten quite a number of emails about that issue. Um, okay, so next up is our speaker, uh, Dave Wilbur with SPAD. And if you could tell us all exactly what SPAD stands for. Uh, I will, I'll do that, Senator. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Senators and committee members. Thank you for uh, coming down to uh, the friendly city, Tifton. Welcome, and thanks for coming south. Uh, my name is Dave Wilber. I am, in addition to the, having the pleasure of being the Director of Diversified Enterprises, a Board of Health program here in South Georgia, uh, I am also the President of SPAD, the, uh, the uh, Service Providers Association for Developmental Disabilities. Uh, a little bit diversified. We're a 53-year-old program. Uh, here in South Georgia that serves over 100 people in non-center-based services, um, a variety of services. We also provide behavioral sports and uh, nursing uh, services to individuals who might need those. And while I don't consider myself an expert in the field, I've been doing this great work since 1984, and I started as a direct sport professional, and obviously have made this my career. My hope today is to focus uh, time on recommendation solutions the committee might consider and I have purposely focused on areas that haven't been overly addressed in the past. And I'll start with, uh, since the great state of Georgia is an employment first state, supported employment. We need to make sure the waivers adequately address supported employment funding that includes not only long-term supports for supported employees, but also adequate funding for transition from school-age children, for school-age children. National studies have demonstrated that supported employees return an average monthly net benefit to taxpayers of $251, and generate $1.46 for every dollar spent. It's a good investment for a business-friendly state. And I've always believed and have seen the best human service program is a job. Our waivers should also include flexibility. A day in the life is not a straight line, and our current waivers do not allow for the fluidity that life truly is. As an example, a day might include some work, some day program, some secondary education, what you do during the day should be a choice and with the most integrated services being funded. Let me transition to the waiting list. You mentioned the waiting list, Senator. Um, several states are using their waiver light option, uh, which would probably be like our now waiver, to address waiting list issues. Not everyone needs the $80,000, what I call the gold card waiver option. Um, some people just need day services or in-home services to support the family nucleus and to keep people healthy. And some states have very successfully uh, driven down and, and strategically eliminated their waivers, waiver waiting list um, by using their waiver light option. It might be something that Georgia could strategically uh, look at. In previous hearings, you've heard about delays in opening residential locations so that services could expand. I would encourage the legislators to get to understand the Georgia Collaborative Administrative Services Organization, or the ASO, that's under contract with DBHDD. The ASO is the vetting agency that allows providers to open new residential services such as group homes and host homes. It is not an exaggeration that it takes over a year to open a new residential option. Beacon Health is also part of the ASO collaborative and we believe that they owe a significant amount of the ownership to the 5% delay that is not coming to providers until mid-December. We also don't believe they have any penalties for non-performance. 
legislators, you guys did your job getting the 5%, and we're very thankful for that and the 2%. We need to really look at the ASO and how they can improve. Lastly, the rate study. You've heard time and again our rates are built on 1063 an hour, which creates a staffing crisis in today's economy. Unlike McDonald's, providers cannot close the, the dining room and just open the drive through we suspect wage rates will be a significant jump from the 1063, and we would again encourage you to fully fund the rate study in FY2425. We also recommend a leg legislative rate increase of 6.2% in the 23 session as a good faith, good faith down payment, which will get us to the $15 an hour range. We don't believe $15 an hour is the right wage, but it is a start. And let me close with this. It's not special to need a place to live, something meaningful to do with your day, to have a job, someone to care for your needs. Early in my career, I heard this quote, a civilization is measured by how it treats its weakest members. And it's the prism I try to use to, use to view the world. And it's similar to what you mentioned at your opening. Uh, senators and committee members, thank you for your time and interest in these issues. Uh, we are always happy to answer any questions now or uh, as you create your report. And again, thank you for your interest in this area. Dave, thank you very much. And uh, before you leave, uh, I want to acknowledge something. We've we've talked about this at our first meeting. I'm going to make sure that our Senate research uh, um, aide here, Jocelyn, has this. We do believe that if we look at the totality of those in the waiting list, that, that a large majority do need a lighter service, like you said, day services, things of that nature, at home care. Uh, and how we address that, uh, I think, is critical to separating those who have extraordinary needs uh, versus those that have needs that are daily family impacting on a regular basis. So that is important. That's definitely going to be part of our results, and, and I certainly appreciate what you're saying. And before you leave that podium, would you hand that sign-in sheet that's below your papers to us? I will have, be happy to. Also, can you make sure you submit your written uh, comments through the website? Sure. Thank you again. Okay, we're going to start uh, public testimony. So I want to remind everybody again that uh, if you go longer than two minutes, you'll be taking time away from somebody else. So when you hear these chimes go off, that means two minutes is up. Okay. Uh, now, a lot of people signed up, and some folks, when they signed up, I think saw it just as a sign-in sheet versus a sign up to comment sheet. So if you want to, uh, and I call your name and you say, oh, I just thought it was a sign up sheet, that's okay. No, but nobody's gonna hold that against you. Uh, but what we're gonna try and do is between Senator Harrell and myself is we're gonna call up that person and the next person or two behind that so you'll be ready so we don't lose time with everybody coming through. So uh, if you're on deck, if you will, if you'll just kind of get back up in the, behind the podium a little bit, we'll be able to get folks through quickly and efficiently so we have the opportunity to hear from everybody. So if that sounds good, we're going to start out with uh, Hillary, is it Vici, V-E-C-E? -E? All right, and then behind her, we're going to put Dana. Uh, I'm not sure I, I've got that. Okay, Dana, where are you, Dana? Okay, Dana, you're going to be on deck, and then behind her will be Caroline Chandler. So, please. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Hillary Vesey. <laughs> um, I'm here representing the Georgia Coalition on Family Advocates um, of Developmental Disabilities. We are a coalition of family members and community members with loved ones all across the state of Georgia. Um, we have at least one of our family members is here today from the Warner Robins area. Thank you for having this committee and having the online option. A lot of our families have young children. They're not able to be here um, on a morning, so thank you. Um, as I know you've been hearing, families are absolutely swamped. They need help. Um, they need support. They need access to waivers and waiver services. They're also concerned about quality education and inclusive opportunities in their schools, in extracurriculars, and after they graduate from high school. Um, we also need accessible programs. And when we say that, we don't just mean programs with accommodations also financially accessible and geographically accessible. Um, we've heard from a parent who had a child in one of the inclusive college programs in Georgia, and they had to withdraw because they couldn't afford it anymore. 
we had a mother who had to create her own swim league for her daughter because their school would not allow her to be on there and she wanted to train to be in Special Olympics. So these are just some of the things that we're hearing and I want you to know we want to be a resource to you and a partner. Um, so I know a lot of our families are going to be putting in testimony um, online and I appreciate that. Um, and what we say is we are trying to reimagine what is possible for all of us. We want you to also be reimagining what's possible when you're making your recommendations and putting together your report. So please see us as partners. We want to be a resource for you. I can provide contact information to you all and anyone here who wants to hear from, the through, hear from our coalition um, or learn more about us. So um, thank you. <laughs> Talked real fast. Dana Lloyd, I work for the Georgia Advocacy Office. Georgia Advocacy Office is Georgia's federally mandated pr protection and advocacy system. Um, we are a partner with the Georgia Council on Developmental Disabilities and Georgia's two USEDs um, at IHDD in Athens and the Center for Leadership and Disability in, um, at Georgia State. So over a decade ago, the United States government and the state of Georgia entered into an agreement to address Georgia's failure to follow the Americans with Disabilities Act. The parties agreed that Georgia had failed to meet its legal obligation to build an adequate community-based system that would support people with disabilities to live me meaningful lives in the community. The agreement primarily addresses the state facilitating people moving from an institutional setting and creating an infrastructure necessary to serve people to live in the community. This infrastructure requires the creation of provider networks, a development of systems of care, oversight, expertise, crisis contingencies, and opportunities to respond to changes and implement modifications where appropriate. Throughout the course of the settlement agreement, the parties have relied on an independent monitor to evaluate the state's compliance. While the tenor of these reports have varied over time and have highlighted some successes, the most recent report raises a multitude of concerns that not only evidence a lack of compliance with the terms of the agreement, but also foreshadows harm to people resulting from a lack of services, failures of oversight, and dramatic deficiencies within existing systems and practices. The theme of the report over the years has been consistent. The state has failed to recruit, train, and develop an appropriate network of qualified providers to serve the varying needs of people to successfully live within the community. And then when confronted with this national labor shortage, the state was already deficient, um, and these, uh, this has evidenced epic failures revo resulting in preventable hospitalizations, injury, incarceration, institutionalization, and death. Temporary respite housing has become permanent for many, which results in providers turning to police, jails, and emergency rooms when people are in des desperate crisis. Everyone recognizes that these issues are difficult and developing a coherent system of care requires thoughtful consideration and implementation. Despite having over a decade of these reports, um, Georgia still fails to demonstrate the ability to, pr to build supports and infrastructure to safely serve people to live in their community. We cannot adequately address the barriers to people coming into waiver services and improving the current system without considering the critical gaps identified by the independent monitor. For too long, the state has offered an array of services that fail to address the fundamental human needs of people served. Real relationships, real homes, real jobs for real wages, and opportunities to be valued contributing citizens. This failure to elevate and integrate our system of care results in real harm, not just noncompliance. The Georgia Advocacy Office asked the committee to review the monitor's reports and incorporate and prioritize those findings and their recommendations. Thank you so much. On deck after Caroline, if we have Dr. Horn and Dave Lamb to be on deck after that. Good morning. It's an honor to be here with you today. I am Caroline Chandler. I have been a um, provider of services in both behavioral health and developmental disabilities for over 24 years. I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Georgia, and I'm coming to you, coming before you today, not only as a constituent and taxpayer, but a member of SPAD of the Georgia Community Service Board Association, an employee of Aspire BHDD, and my most important role as mother of an adult child with, with disabilities. My view from each of these roles brings me great concern for the state's most dependent and vulnerable populations. I've been a first-hand witness to the inequity of access to care 
while access to both behavioral health and addictive diseases are readily available to persons seeking treatment. Unfortunately, that's not the case for our intellectual and developmental disability population. They must wait on a waiver slot to receive access to the care they need and they deserve. I urge you to ensure that the IDD population receives not only the necessary funding for the waiver slots, but that we support providers in recruitment and retention of adequate credentialed staff. With the ongoing workforce shortage, while providers are not going to be able to support the individuals who do receive the waiver services, so we must have both in order to be successful. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And Senator, before he starts, Dave Lamb, I'm going to decline. You've got so many votes. You have my submitted test. Oh, thank you. Thank Appreciate you. that. All right, so after uh, Dr. Horn, we're going to have Quentin Jackson and it looks like Raphael Shepard. Senators and honorable committee members, thank you very much for giving me the floor this morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Marco Horn. I'm a management and entrepreneurship faculty at uh, Mercer University, so I'm not really an industry insider. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. John Crispin from Valdosta State, and I, we've been consulting in this industry for six, seven years now. Uh, we have been working closely with United States Cerebral Palsy, um, one of the largest providers in the state, and our involvement has been improving the workforce. So I'm essentially here to speak out um, on behalf of the workforce in this industry. Uh, as you are probably fully aware, the, I think, 2017 presidential report um, entitled, or titled Workforce in Crisis, um, all of the, um, and if you have not seen the report, I gladly point you towards it, but um, the, all of the, the points mentioned in that uh, report are still very, very valid and, and still a problem in the state of Georgia. Uh, one of the biggest problems these organizations face is the turnover. It's, it is extremely difficult to keep people employed in that industry, and that is in direct contrast to the mission that just about every single one of these organizations have. The mission is that the clients will be able to live their best life possible their best life possible will only work if there is a relationship that is built between the caretakers and the clients and the caretakers are able to identify the individual talents of the clients that they can understand where to slot them into the workforce and, and all of those issues that have been mentioned here. In this industry, um, or if, if on a rare first hand kind of testimony, uh, I would also like to point you to a book, the, uh, the Ghost Boy, if you have not read the book, The Ghost Boy, uh, written from uh, Michael Pistorius. He was a client in that in industry. Um, he was, um, he fell ill as a child and ended up in services, and he was non-responsive, and it was only through the help of a caretaker that really treated him like a human being that they identified that there is still a mind living in that body and they identified help and services for him, starting with eye tracker movements and that kind of stuff, and his, his abilities uh, slowly improved to the point that he ended up being mobile in a wheelchair, he ended up being married, and he ended up writing this book. So I, can, I would highly suggest, if the, because that's true testimony of a client in that industry, not somebody that's just working in that industry, but somebody who has been in these services, it's called Ghost Boy. <clears throat> so really, um, Thank you very much for the time. I hear the chime, and I know if, if, uh, if it would be with my students, they're always shuffling at this point. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just leave you my card, if I may, Please. Um, in case you have any other questions about our involvement with consulting with this industry. We would gladly answer all of the questions you may have in this, in this industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we had uh, Quentin. And then behind that, we've got, I think it's Raphael. OK, Raphael, I'm sorry. And then Good. we have Steve after that. Go right ahead, sir. Good morning. My name is Quentin Jess. I've been living in the group home since I graduated from high school 2016. My staff support me very well, but it could be better if we all get along with each other. I have had a lot of turnovers when staff get fired or quit. It make me mad and sad. It's very hard when we have trouble sometimes when staff get frustrated because we want to go somewhere, one person don't want to go. Well, then we all have to stay at home. We are three grown men. We should get treated equally. I want to live on my own soon, but I got to get more things working down, like on my anger. 
but it would be started. I would start looking for my own place, but bills would be getting more higher. Buying furniture, food, transportation, rent, power, and other bills with more possible with not a priority on the waiting list. Then in order to get in government house, they take a long time. Senator Warnock said, if someone hired you to do the job, do the job they hired you to do. That's what I want for my state representatives. And I'll leave you with this. Keep doing your best every day, and if no one else is proud, you be proud of yourself. Great job, Brian. That was fantastic. Thank you. And then we got Steve behind him and Sheila Jeffrey behind Steve. Hey everyone, my name is Rattia Shepard. I have been receiving support in the community for a while now. I live in a group home right now, but I have worked hard to learn skills to to be able to live on my own. <laughs> I can't find a place that I can afford the rent for one bedroom apartment. A small house would take all my money I get. People with disabilities get stuck and go prone or with roommate because we are poor. I love to have a place that my kids to visit. I usually see them at my mom's house instead. Some of the staff that some of the stuff that have helped me have been great. Have been great. But it's hard when they have been a hundred people most of the time. The staff leaves because the low pay are they're working two jobs. I would love to tell you I had one staff that have been been with me. Thank you for listening. Great job. <laughs> Back to fall. Yeah, Roger that. <laughs> Glad I was behind them. Uh, good morning. My name is Steve Hormio, and I work at the Lounge Advocacy Resource Center. Uh, it's a day center in Valdosta, Georgia, and I'd like to thank y'all for first of all coming down, but also allowing us to speak <clears throat> in this format. Um, as we all know, we've gone through a health crisis. Uh, we've talked about that fairly regularly. Uh, I want to I give you kind of a, a real short look, and I know I, I've got two minutes on this short look, uh, as to how it's affected day centers. So uh, as we, we went through this and started this, uh, everything shut down. Well, we decided, my boss decided that we were going to open up as soon as possible. We created a list of most in need to bring back as quickly as possible. We started with two, then we went to five, and then we brought 10, and then those folks were able to <clears throat> help us train other folks uh, to be safe, um, sanitizing our building, washing hands, social distancing, masking, all those types of things. And, and another uh, impact of that was that a number of day centers shut down. And so what that did is there, were, there are more and more people in our area that do not have the ability to go to a day center in their area. So we started reaching out further with our transportation. And so, as everybody knows, the cost of transportation that, that we provide uh, has gone through the roof, not only with gas, but you can't find parts 
We, you know, if you have a vehicle that breaks down, it's very difficult to get it repaired or to get a new vehicle. So I would ask this committee to consider as part of access to these programs, right, that transportation is part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have Sheila Jeffrey, then we have Stephanie Smith, and then Denise Lawson, if you could line up. Good morning. Hi, my name is Sheila. I live in Union City, Georgia. I have a disability, but I don't call myself with a disability. I say I have ability. I live in, I lived in an institution. I lived in, at an early age. I was actually five when I went in my first institution. I lived in different ones. They were not fun. But I moved out on July 13, 2007. I moved out of Central State. That was the last one I was in. I get services in the community, but it's very hard because the supports aren't there. DSPs don't get paid fair wages. And also, people that are in nursing homes should be able to choose where they want to live. And they should have funding for DSPs to support those moving out because people with disabilities want to live a normal life with paid supports to make their own choices about daily living and choices about what they want to do. They want to live a normal life just like you because we don't have a disability, we have ability. Thank you. Good morning, how is everyone today? Great, thank you. Thank you for um, hosting this. Um, my name is Stephen Smith. I am the Deputy Director of IDD Services at the CSB of Middle Georgia. We came a long way this morning, but we just wanted to take any chance we can to advocate for our individuals they are very special we just went through a oh, uh, pretty much everybody knows a horrible horrible pandemic that hopefully is at the tail end but it really affected how um individuals in the state are able to receive services and one thing that i can proudly say is that while at the csb of middle georgia we only closed our doors for maybe three weeks and then we opened back up under safety protocols of course and um, we have successfully been providing services to our individuals since then. Our workforce, like everyone else in the state, is suffering. One of the main reasons is I, th I know that there's, works, there's things in the works, but the wages for individuals that work with these wonderful people are not representative of the job they do. I have staff that um, do things that would make me cringe, but they do it with a smile on their face because they love these individuals. Um, Willie and Denise are with me from CSB Middle Georgia. So I'm going to come up, call them up one at a time. They're going to introduce okay. themselves to you guys, and then they're just going to tell you what they, you know, what about their services. So come on okay. up. Let me go up with them. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Connie Bryant. I'm a support staff for Denise Lawson, who is an individual. We are from Pulaski County, which is a very small town not far from Macon. Uh, Denise is just going to share a couple of things that we provide services for her. Just tell them she lives on her own with her son in rural uh, Pulaski County. And what kind of things do you do or need done for you with us? Like, for instance, we help her with money management. We help her. She comes to the day program. And what do we do at the day program? Well, we uh, do a lot of cooking and stuff, and they take us on a lot of places to go and stuff like that. And, and Denise, being a mother, single mother, she has to have cooking skills and all that kind of stuff. In addition to what staff does every day in a normal day program, we're trying to teach her uh, skills of how to survive as a parent and as a home, uh, provide home owner or whatever she rents, and her, she and her son live there. And um, Denise has been with us for many, many years. She came from the school system at um, 18, and she's now in her 30s, I think, 40s. 
No, yeah. I'm 42. She's 42. I'm 42. <laughs> Excuse me. She is 42. You're looking but, great, sweetie. Uh, in, our, you. in our area, one of the lacking things, we have a barrier with, uh, I heard transportation mentioned, that is a very, very large barrier for us, keeping staff because of the competitive. And I'm not, you know, trying to get into the administrative part, but we don't have staff that stay because of the competitive wages. They'll leave us and go to McDonald's, leave us and go to Wendy's because the wages are higher. But the ones that stay there are dedicated, but the transportation is really, really a barrier in the rural counties because we have to travel so far to get to anything to do. And uh, that's something I hope that we can address and, uh, you know, it will help help people like Denise that we have to take shopping and all that kind of stuff, okay? Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and she was scared to talk, so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is another one of our individuals from Pulaski County, Willie McClarty. Okay. He'll probably talk, I hope. <laughs> Hey, good morning. Good morning, Willie. Well, one other thing we do at um, Complexity Casino is that we go to places and um, and one of my services is CLS. I got it when my mom got um, sick and they come around to pay my bills. And we have some great loving um out at the plastic casino. And, um, you know, they go out their way to help us and capture the places that we want to go. And, um, as, um, at, that, um, I believe with this, no matter what your disability is, always to believe in yourself. Great job. Okay. We've got Keith and uh, is that for Troy? Um, Senator, they um, they are in the overflow room. They they we're going to decline them. Speak okay, right all right. Thank fine. you all so much. Thank you very much. All right, I've got Harry Ham next, and I'm going to put Lauren Gray and Kay Edie on deck. Thank you. I'm not going to take anywhere near your two minutes, but I want to tell you that Lark in Valdosta has existed for 53 years, and I've been in the field that long. Not in this field, but I uh, am school psychologist, administrator for programs for severely disturbed children, and 22 years is running this program. We've seen a lot of changes. Many of the people who are in my program I evaluated as children in public schools. They are elderly, um, as I am, of course, but um, they're part of our family, and they're just wonderful people. We look forward to seeing them every day. We had 18 people who were state funded who were abruptly cut from services two years ago because the state wasn't going to fund them anymore. We didn't believe they'd be cut, but they were. And they had been in services for up to 25 years themselves and just abruptly cut. I doubt they're on the waiting list. Uh, they could be, but we have tried to find other ways to serve a few of those people at least a day or so a month. We've written grants to agencies. The Kiwanis Club helps sponsor a few of the people. Easter Seals helps fund a day a month, uh, or sometimes a day a week. But we've, we've had to find ways because we can't let these people go. We even, as we pick up four other people to take them in the community, we'll go by and get people who aren't even in our program anymore because there's no funding for them. That isn't right. The other thing I want to add is that we have families who come in, probably at least one family a week who comes in our door saying, my child is, is finishing high school. He needs a place to go. How do we get services? And we try to talk to them about the waiver and they leave thinking they're gonna just go get a waiver and that person's coming straight into our program. And we don't wanna tell them it's gonna be a year or five years or 10 years because that's what it's been in the past. So if y'all can help us and you, I know you understand all that, but that's reality as well. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. All right, Lauren Gray. Thank y'all for having us. Um, so I'm here representing the Georgia Occupational Therapy Association. I'm an occupational therapy assistant. And while our initial issue is the fact that occupational therapy assistants are not covered under Medicaid, I also want to speak out um, as to this issue. I worked for many years in a public school system um, treating individuals with special needs. Many of my families graduated not knowing where their children would go. Um, where their services would be coming from. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of access to services 
after they age out of the school system at age 21. Um, I have done research on the now and comp waivers. Um, occupational therapy is covered under those waivers, but occupational therapy assistants are not, um, which directly limits the access to services um, in Georgia. We have four occupational therapy assistant programs. We have one in Cochrane, Georgia, which is where I'm from, uh, Middle Georgia State University. We've been having that program for over 25 years now. We have one at Albany State, Augusta, Uni or Augusta Tech, and then also up in Chattahoochee, Georgia. Um, many of our students are from rural areas and want to work in those rural areas, but there is limited job opportunities in those areas for them. Um, because access is directly limited in those rural areas for individuals with special needs, I feel like if occupational therapy assistance were covered, it would increase the access to those services. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And Kay, yes. Yes. come on down. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you all so much for this opportunity. It's really, really important to me. My name is Dr. Kay Eady. I am a retired educator of 30 years. Currently, I'm a community organizer and an advocate for the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative, as well as the Human Rights Watch out of Washington, D.C. But my most important role of all is being a mother of a son with special needs. So I come to you today to ask you all to explore and continue to do what you can for the unlock the Medicaid waiver. I took a look at that list and I was just shocked and appalled that it was so long. I really encourage you to find a way to separate the list from those that really, really need the services versus those that are not in need as much. Secondly, the most important thing too is that we need to find a way to attract and retain qualified staff to work in day centers. Now my son attends a day center and while they are absolutely wonderful with what they do and they are absolutely excellent in using the funds that they have, it is clear that they need to be able to pay their staff more money so that they can continue to provide the services for the people that are there. And lastly, 14C is a baby of mine. The Fair Wage, wage Act where members of the community with disabilities are paid less for performing their jobs. I ask you all to explore that as well and support us in trying to remove 14C from the state of Georgia. The list is extremely long. I took a list at that list yesterday and I was really, really shocked to find that there are so many in our own state, in our local community, that support 14C. I implore you all to take a look at that and please do what you can because it is true that the strong must carry the weak and it's our responsibility, it's our responsibility to support people with disabilities as much as we can. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. At this moment, we're going to take a break for about 10 minutes to do a couple of things. First thing we need to do is if you have already had the opportunity to speak uh, and uh, you want to stay for the rest of the committee, we're going to ask you to go to the overflow room so the folks that are in the overflow room can come down here so they can speak. Uh, of course, it is being live streamed as well and being recorded, so for those that, that do not see the end, that's always going to be available to you. But we're going to take about 10 minutes to make that shuffle. So again, if you can, if you've already spoken uh, and you're not on the list anymore, we're going to ask the people who are upstairs to come downstairs and we're going to do the swap, okay? Well, we're going, to, we're going to reconvene in about 10 minutes. Thank you.
You've already spoken again. If you could please uh, either go to the overflow room if you've already spoken. That would be very helpful. Uh, we're going to uh, just keep the folks in here who haven't had the opportunity to speak yet. And we're going to start with that in just one minute. So if you get yourself settled, we appreciate it. Okay, we're going to get to the next list. The well, first person we're going to have come up is Jennifer Stevens, and I'd like to ask to be on deck Danny Hoover and then Lynn Platt. Good morning. Hello. Um, today I want to talk about access to services and care. My name is Jennifer Stevens, and I have worked at a community service board for 16 years. And I'm also a licensed professional counselor. So I've had the pleasure of working with behavioral health and developmental disabilities separately and together. Um, I have seen in behavioral health, on the behavioral health side of the house, of our house, of, of uh, Spire or any other CSB, that you can walk in easily and say you need help and get services. So you usually are seen the same day. You usually can go ahead and get linked to a doctor or a nurse or a counselor. That does not that is not the case for people with a disability, developmental disability. Some who have developmental disabilities that want services have to complete a long, tedious application. It's hard to find which application is the right one. It's hard to fill out, um, and you have to send it to the Region Four field office, and then you wait years to help to get help. Over 7,000 people are waiting for help. That is if the person can actually fill out the application. A lot of people with disabilities are not able to understand the application or not able to get the items that are required or need help doing that. However, the closest regional field office to um, the counties that we serve is over an hour away. So if we have more funding for supports, there can be more increased access and an easier way to get services. Um, I'm a numbers person. One of the things I did was do, do the math on the 135. If there are exactly 7,000 people on the waiting list and 135 got waivers, that means that less than 2% got that. So that's not very much. So that's it. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Danny Hoover. I provide behavior supports uh, here in South Georgia uh, for an agency called Diversified Enterprises. Um, uh, my director already spoke and a couple of people that we support uh, have already spoken as well. Um, and we've heard a lot about services today. Um, but I, I think that we need to focus more on that human side because we've been talking about human services. Because if you start talking about services for 7,000 people, you forget each one of them is a person. So each one of those people needs us. They need to have something provided for them. We don't, you know, we talk about small needs and high needs and any need is a need. So we need to focus in on, on each one of those as a human being and, and, and know that they, they have value and they should be as important as any other person uh, that we interact with. We have to focus on the people, um, it, it, and the people that provide supports are, are also important, but each one of those people that we support is so important and, and vital. Um, you know, I'm also a numbers person. Jenny and I have been um, uh, working together with uh, supporting people, uh, and with behavior supports, it's all about numbers, right, and data and graphs and that sort of thing, and when you fund one person with a waiver, you're most likely going to also be funding at least one job, at least one job. And it could be two or three jobs. So if you can fund 7,000 people to have waiver services, we, we would like to find out what exactly the number of jobs you would be creating. You could be creating up to 14, 15, 16,000 jobs 
by fully funding the waiver. And if you can give 15, 16, this is two Rivian plants spread out all over the state. So we're not just focused on one thing, we can focus on all of those individual people. And, and I just wanna leave you with this, fairness, right? We talk about fairness quite a bit in, in this field and fairness does not mean that we all get the same thing. None of us need the same thing in here. Fairness means we get what we need to be successful. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, after Lynn, we're gonna have Cameron Bishop and Tom Bauer on deck. So is Lynn Platt here? Oh, okay. Come I didn't hear down. you Okay. <laughs> All right. Hi, my name is Lynn Platt. And I, my name is Lynn Platt, and I'm from Pierce County, Georgia. And I'm going to say kudos to everybody that has spoken because I said they're overworked, underpaid, and cutting corners in the crisis of the caregiver. Caregivers are so underpaid. I take care of my uncle. Since I was 18 years old, he's 68 years old now. He has Down syndrome, special needs, and everything else, and he's home and he's getting services. But the caregivers that I get are not paid enough, but they're good to him, and they take very well care of him. And it's the possibility that having someone to stay with him long term is awful because the caregivers are not being paid enough. And that's one of the issues. Transportation is another issue. He has to go to get to he has a wound that has went from a level four to a zero, but the wound care is for his transportation. He's missed seven appointments to wound care, seven appointments to bone and joint because of transportation, not being able to come get him because he needs to be on a stretcher and they said they can't come. So that's another issue is transportation in the rural areas. I wanna say kudos to everybody else that has spoken as well on that as far as, I've also, with the Now in Comp waiver, I'm a big advocate for our community. I was nominated for the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiver of the Year of State of Georgia and was nominated and received that. But I advocate for all of my people. And I had one lady, I told her, with the Now in Comp waiver, you have to apply while they're in middle school. Go ahead and apply while he was in middle school. And she did. And she came to see me at my job. And we were talking. And she said, I hadn't heard anything. I said, call them. Call Savannah office. Find out. She called Savannah office and she was accepted with the now in comp waiver because she didn't know what to do and I, I've always been an advocate in my community as far as helping everybody not just my uncle that I take care of but I just hope that y'all can look at the fact that these people that work in these daycare centers the nursing homes these caregivers are so underpaid and when you send funding down I understand that the corporate all of them have to get a little pot of the money out of that but make sure that the caregiver if you're sending down say ten dollars make sure that caregiver is getting five of that dollars and not going to the corporate office for another five thank you thank you good morning I'm Cameron Bishop I'm the president and CEO of Wesley Glenn Ministries we're in Macon and St. Mary's Georgia and first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for the work that you've done and the work you're doing and the work you're going to keep on doing. Um, and I know that everybody comes after you and they want a piece of you and you got to put money all over the place. So thank you for considering all of us. I'm the rookie in the room. I've only been doing this for nine months. I came from child welfare. Um, and so I don't know a whole lot. Um, but what I learned when I got to, to Wesley Glen was in child welfare, we don't have a wait list. They need services, they get services, and here we do. And y'all have heard that, and you know that. Um, the other thing I've learned is I want to grow. And to grow, it takes money, and everybody wants money. And so y'all talking about increasing rates and, and all this good stuff, and they're doing the rate study. We did one internally, just I said, what does it actually cost us to take care of somebody versus what are we getting paid? We get about 70% of what it takes. Um, but I'm blessed because I have an incredible fundraising department. And they go out and they raise money and they fill that gap. And my dream is to be able to use that money to open new homes, open new programs, do innovative practices and best practices for the people we're serving. And so I look to you guys, help us. We want to help y'all. We stand with you in what you're doing. Um, and so we're just so thankful that you are doing this and, and leading this charge and thankful for Darcy and all that GCDD is doing and all that SPAD is doing along the way. Um, and I would answer questions, but I know you got a lot of people to talk to. So, um, thank you for your t thank you for your time, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Okay, after Tom, we're going to have Deanne Julia and Amanda Manchester on deck, and we all know Tom. 
Not such a good thing. Huh? Oh, no. Very good thing. <laughs> uh, Good morning. I'm Tom Bauer. I'm with the George Occupational Therapy Association, and I am uh, following up uh, with uh, Lauren Gray's testimony and about the re Medicaid reimbursement of occupational therapy assistance. Uh, uh, we realize I've talked to Senator Harrell some, and I we realize this is not perfectly on point with the purpose of this committee, but uh, I know you're concerned about workforce shortage. And by the way, thank you, Senator Harrell, for your, your bill this year that you got passed on the, the, the study. Uh, I think that's going to be very helpful. Uh, so uh, we're not quite sure to the extent that uh, Medicaid covers adult services under the, the waivers, and we're looking into that, but uh, there is a the, there's an anomaly here that all, about 85 percent of the states cover OT assistance services under Medicaid and uh, and in Georgia in fact we cover it part of the school system which is CISS but the CIS program is not so uh, again thank you for the opportunity we just wanted to get it on your radar screen and hopefully work further with you on this thank you so much Tom. all right uh Deanne? Hi, my name's Amanda Manchester. I'm with Legacy Behavior Health. I'm one of their um, consumers. Um, since the pandemic, we've um, had everything was taken away, all the centers, but then when we reopened, we um, our Cook Center was taken away from us. Um, we be cut due to fundings. We um, can't open the Bering Center, and but right now we're out in the community and um, we're trying like our best to uh, do with what we have, and we um, we go to like the Turner Center and you know uh, we do uh, get to do do f different things like. Um, what we have on these posters, we um, we created it, we uh, put it together, and there's like so much more that we can be able to do, but we don't have the funding for. Thank you. Great job. Thank you for making the questions. Do you love that? All right, and uh, Amanda, after you, we just want to get on deck. We've got uh, Quadonna Hamilton and Marion. Hi, I'm Deanna Julian. I am um, Executive Director for the ARC of Southwest Georgia, which is formerly Albany Advocacy Resource Center, or Albany ARC. Um, and if you were doing this work back in 99 or 2000, you probably remember our former director, Miss Annette Bowling, who did a lot of work around this unlock the waiting list. Um, I too come from education. Um, I taught 16 years in special education at a high school and got out of that because I saw a lot of my students after we had worked to get them jobs and to go nowhere to a waiting list with over 10,000 people at that time. Um, we have been at Albany ARC and ARC Southwest Georgia. We've been serving individuals with disabilities in Southwest Georgia since 1963. We will celebrate our 60th anniversary next year. We have an unwavering dedication to civil and human rights for people with developmental disabilities. And as as an educator, I'm just going to wrap up because I know we're getting close to what some of our people have said in here. As a member of SPAD, we are have got to support this DSP workforce crisis. We have families calling every day that need help. And although we truly appreciate the 518 waivers, we as providers cannot take any new people because we can't support them. Um, and as Dana Lloyd from the Department of um, Georgia Advocacy said, you know, we are failing people with providing quality care. Um, it it costs individuals over $150,000 to support them in institutions or in nursing homes. 83000 for the waiver is not that much when you look at it, but as Dave said before with SPAD, if we can tailor those waivers, not everybody needs a full 83000 And I think if we look at employment first, as Darcy did all of her work when she was here as an employment first state, we are trying to put people to work, which cost much less than supporting people in day centers and supporting people. And those rates for supportive employment are lower than putting people to in, in day centers all day. Um, so we really want to look at that. Um, we have 
so much turnover in our, DS, our DSP workforce crisis. We have about 59% um, turnover rate right now, um, and we are averaging about 3,000 hours a pay period of overtime every two weeks, which is about a $1.6 million hit to our budget. Um, so. And, and we have families that are calling that are having to make the tax-paying citizens that are having to make the decision to stay at home with their families, with their children with disabilities, because they have nowhere to go. Luckily, as a transition coordinator, I have some of my former students and families here that had the ability to get on the waiting list when they were in middle school. Um, but those families that don't know have nowhere to go and are having to make that choice to stay at home and not work. So thank you for your time. My name is Kadonna Hamilton. I go to Les Behavior Health. I like the program. Like the program. But, we need more funding. but we need more funding to open up, to open up the, centers the centers in our area. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Marion Jackson, and I'm a part of the Jasmine Place in Fitzgerald, Georgia. And my concern is uh, people on the waiting list. Also, people that that need services that are not receiving services. Uh, I know that the um, funds are are very short. But I would like to just ask y'all to look further into this because we have so many people that's on the waiting list and we have people that's working to help people with disabilities and stuff. I have a disability and I am the mother of a son that has a disability. So this is very important to me. And I would just like for y'all to take the time to look further into this and to help us reach our goal or the goal to get to do better. Thank you. And I want to add to that. Um, I wanted to add to that. Um, also, we have people that would like to own their own home. Um, they have good credit, but not enough money. And so I would like for y'all to search into the uh, teaching them or uh, getting up a fund that they can be able to own their own home. I have a person, he bought a trailer when we went to the bank for him to apply for a home. Uh, he found the brick home, but his income was not high enough, so he had to settle for a trailer. I've got Andrew next. No last name. Is Andrew here? All right. Come on down. And then uh, behind that, we've got Kakiria. Thank you. And <laughs> Carolyn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take my mask off. All right. All right, lady. Uh, my name is Andrew. Oops, and I live in Thomasville, and I'm from Moultrie. And I like my staff. They take me on the outing and take me shopping. And they take me home to visit my family if I want to. I, um, How do you feel when staff have to leave because they don't make enough money? That's what you told me. I would feel sad, really sad, when the staff leave. Mm -hmm. And my staff take care of me sometimes even though I have any friends. But if I do this now, my staff can help me this. My staff can let me make choices, and I like that. Great job. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. My name is Kakiria Thomas, and I'm with Georgia Pines. And so... What I wanted everybody to know is Georgia Pines serves approximately 6,000 people. 
um, annually in six southwestern co um, counties. That's mental health, addiction, um, and IDD. We currently serve approximately 90 individuals with IDD that includes residential services, a service center, and daily nursing services for individuals who serve, who are so severely um, medically fragile. My background is I'm a social worker. I work for DFACS. Then I went to um, support coordination. My child could not understand why I did what I did when I worked for DFACS because I was always on call, always helping other children. She felt like they had parents. Why could they not do what they need to do for their children? So I started working from home. Everybody know when the pandemic hit, everything shut down. So I worked from home for four years. Then I decided to get back out and I started working with Georgia Pines. So coming from support coordination, my job was to make sure everybody was doing what they needed to do for the individuals in this room. So I oversaw services. Now as part of the team <laughs> that are making sure that we take care of everybody, I see it from a different light. It is very difficult to ensure that they have what they need when you're short staff. That's very difficult. That means sometimes we, me and my coworker, are working day shift. Sometimes that means we have to go into homes and work night shift. So um, it's very difficult when we are trying to compare their pay rate to McDonald's. So we're competing. Um, it's very difficult when you are trying to explain to families that they're not their children's legal guardian. Once you hit 18, you're an adult. So as a prior support coordinator, it was explained to families with children with intellectual disabilities, you need to obtain guardianship as a child. As an adult, you don't obtain it unless you go through probate court. We need families to understand that and be educated on that prior to them turning 18 or they need to go through probate court. Um, we just need everybody to know and understand and support that we understand everybody wants a piece of the pie, as someone has already said. We need everybody to understand that if everybody comes out and live the lives and work in the homes to see what it's really like, maybe that would make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, how y'all doing? My coworker about done said it all. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, my name is Carolyn Bavard and um, I've been working with Georgia Pine now going into 21 years. I started out in the residential as a DSP and then I got promoted to a site supervisor at the site. Then I got promoted to a program to, uh, program manager. Uh, we have, I have seen the ins and the outcomes uh, when I first started. It's a totally different picture now. Uh, we struggling with keeping staff because of funds. That's our biggest turnover. Once we get the staff in, they find out Arby's or anybody else making more money, they gone. And we just, you know, we put not money there and losing money there because we're doing the training and then they leave and going somewhere else. I love my job. I've been doing it for 21 years and that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes the list of folks who have signed up. Uh, thank you. Uh, if there is somebody either uh, in the overflow room or someone who is here that did not sign up and did not see the sign-up sheet, uh, please uh, raise your hand now so we can recognize you for a moment or two. Well, we did pretty good. Uh, we didn't want to interrupt the meeting flow as it came in, but we do have one of our esteemed committee members here, Senator Donzella James, and I'd like to give her a moment to introduce herself. Good morning. Good morning. I'm State Senator uh, Donzella James from District 35, the Atlanta area, but I uh, have listened to you. I got here halfway through, got lost on the freeway, but I'm here now. <laughs> But um, I, I thank you for your responses to us. It will help us to uh, make sure that we work hard to come up with some good solutions. And I enjoy being on this committee. I have a, a, a grandson that's artistic, 
And now I have hope for him because I see all of you. And you're young adults now, many of you. And he's only nine years old. So I see that he can get uh, better and better. And I want to unlock that waiting list. And you, you educated me this morning to let me know that I better look for, what is it, comp, uh, now in comp waiver for him in the future. Thank you. Okay, so this is the fourth meeting that we've had. Uh, we've had two meetings in Atlanta. The first one was in July, which was majorly a organizational meeting. Uh, then our next meeting, we took public testimony in Atlanta. Last month, we went to Rome, and we also had a crowded room in Rome. Um, and then this is our fourth meeting. We have a fifth meeting scheduled back in Atlanta in November. If there are folks out there who have not been able to testify, we can take testimony uh, at the November meeting, but because we will be moving into the stage where we are writing our recommendations and going through everything that we have to go through between now and then, which is a lot, um, we would like anybody who wants to testify in November to submit their written testimony ahead of time so that we can take that into account um, as we do our studying during the next month. Um, I will say my observations at this point are that we are in a very serious crisis and it is much worse than um, I knew it to be when we got started. So the, the testimony has been very helpful uh, to be able to see uh, the depth. It's like, it's, like we, it's like we had a hole in our safety net and I knew we had a hole in our safety net, but now that hole I think is just caving in on itself. Um, and that's largely due to the pandemic, but we were in a weakened state before we went into the pandemic and, and that's just made everything cave in. Um, I know we're at the point where um, we have elections in front of us, so it's kind of a, a time of, of turmoil, um, but I would say that this is in my perspective, a crisis that is huge enough um, that we really need the attention of the governor's office in addition to the legislature. Um, so we have a lot of work to do in the next few weeks and a lot to read and a lot to study and a lot of discussions. First, I want to thank everybody who has come today. To everyone here who has a special need, a special gift, you're awesome. You are loved, and we care about you. Now, to everyone else who here who is either a caregiver, whether that be working um, for the state, working in a private group, uh, or a family member, you are a hero, and nothing short of that. Know that we care. We're doing this because we want to improve it and make it better. Uh, and together we're going to do that. So thank you for what you're doing every day. You don't get the thanks uh, that you deserved uh, on a daily basis, but we're here to tell you today, thank you and God bless you. Thank you. All right, that's it. All right, we're here by adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>